it's time for religious communities to actually meet people where they are and not try to move them along to some better destination. You can bring your sense of resentment, like, God, this is not what we talked about. Bring that, bring that. Welcome to the For the Love podcast with me, Jen Hatmaker. Today, we're talking about how to gain small wins through becoming more connected to mindfulness and spirituality with Reverend Naomi Washington Liebhart. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. We are in a series right now that I have loved so much. It's been nurturing to me, nourishing to me and to you. You've let me know. It's called For the Love of Small Wins. (laughs) I think you can kind of understand why we wanted to steer the ship into some hope and nurture after this year. We're rounding the bend here to the final stretch of 2020. We're coming up on the holiday season, but if you're anything like me, our hearts are probably a little bit heavier this year. Our hands may be a little slower to deck the halls. We've just, we've missed each other, right? We've missed the way things used to be. We've missed having the privilege of the ease kind of in which we used to live in the world. We've missed the promise of meeting new people and going to new places. We've just felt a lot of loss this year. I am first in line. Like I am first in line and raising my hand saying this year has included so much suffering and struggle. And yet I don't think it'll always be this way. I know right now I'm thinking about Advent season. It's got me thinking about Mary and Joseph and how, you know, they were forced to flee in the middle of the night and go to Egypt. I mean, Egypt you guys with their toddler just to keep him safe. Do you remember that? Like after the wise men visit Jesus, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Hey, get out of here. Like Herod's after you. And so literally wakes up Mary and they, they go to Egypt like overnight. It's just like a little footnote in the Bible barely, but it's something I think we maybe we can relate to right now in a new way. You know, this little family left everything and everyone they knew just to keep themselves safe. And they had no idea how long they'd be hiding out for safety. They had no idea what to pack or how long it was supposed to last. They're in a new place to live, finding a new way to get food and water and sustenance for themselves. And I'm starting to imagine like their happiness when they learned they could finally go back home, right? I'm thinking about Mary when she finally saw a familiar face in town or just the joy when she got to return to a routine, to her community, to her people. I know that right now our spiritual small wins is maybe a hard topic to think about because we're tired and we're not sure when things are going to go back or return. So I wonder, I wonder if we can just hold all that gently whatever we have learned, whatever we have lost, whatever we are still afraid of, whatever we we are hopeful for into our conversation today. Because, well, first of all, let me tell you right out of the gate, I cried my eyes out in the middle of this interview today. I had to get the bottom of my shirt and wipe my nose and my face off. We have a really special guest today. Her name is Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart. And she is nothing short of our pastor today. She is pastoring us. She is our spiritual guide on this podcast today. Reverend Naomi, she amplifies and celebrates religious life in Philadelphia. That's where she lives. She's the director of the mayor's office of faith-based and interfaith affairs in Philadelphia. She's also an adjunct professor of theology at Villanova. In the past, she has also served as the Faith Work Director for the National LGBTQ Task Force, which is actually the country's oldest national LGBTQ justice and equality group. Pretty incredible. Reverend Naomi is obviously an ordained minister. She was also recently named an LGBTQ faith leader to watch in 2019 by the Center for American Progress and one of the Route 100. She is an outstanding faith leader. I mean, outstanding. I'm so glad she's on the show today. She is full of, like I cry right now, just thinking about it again, but just wisdom and generosity. And I don't even know who's going to listen today, but if I'm the only person who got to listen to this today, that was enough for me. She really served me today. 
minister to me. I think this is going to be hopeful for you. I think you're going to find so much love and grace in this conversation. It's just so many of us have suffered this year and faith and Jesus and love. It, it's everything we need it to be. It really is. And putting ourselves under leaders like Reverend Naomi, it's wise. So I'm so happy to have her pastor us today. And I'm so glad that she's here. I'm so glad to introduce her to so many of you. You're going to love her. So with that, here is my incredible conversation with the absolutely wonderful Reverend Naomi Washington Lee Parton. Hey, Reverend Naomi, I am so pleased to meet you. Me and my team are crazy about you. We just keep going back and forth about your work and what you do. And I'm just tickled to have you on the, on the podcast. Thanks for saying yes. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I, I feel like I'm in such great company with your audience community and your, your previous guests. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So I have told my listeners a little bit about you, all of your really you know, impressive stuff that you do, that you've done, that you are doing. But I wonder if just for a minute, could you walk it back a little bit for my listeners and talk a little bit more about your story, like wh- where are you from? What was your kind of your childhood space? Because it's an interesting journey to find out how you got to where you are, how you found your way leading at such kind of high levels of spiritual and faith leadership. And so I wonder if you could just 35,000 foot view that for us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and that is critical to my sense of identity, my sense of understanding of the world, and my spiritual formation, too. I was raised in a Black Baptist church. So that was my childhood. And then I moved to Philadelphia to go to college, in part because I felt like I didn't know anything about the world outside of the west side of Detroit. And I wanted to see if I could make it on my own. But I wanted to also go to a place where I know I knew I could be involved in a faith community. I felt like if I'm going to leave my church, I need to find one wherever I'm going. And I had the experience of meeting a, a Philadelphia-based pastor in Detroit my senior year of high school. He was doing a revival. And I went up to him and I was like, I got accepted to this school in Philadelphia. Do you know it? <laughs> and he said, yeah, my, my, my church is literally 10 blocks from that university. And so he gave me his card and he said, when you get to Philadelphia, call me and we will send the church van to come pick you up and be part of our community. So that to me was the sign from heaven that (laughs) Philadelphia was the place where I should go. So I came to Philadelphia now 20 years ago and have been here in and around Philadelphia ever since. And, you know, I moved 700 miles away geographically from my community of origin. And I also feel like You know, sitting here today, I have moved miles and miles away theologically from the place I was raised. And so now I'm active, you know, in a variety of communities of faith that don't look anything like the communities of faith I was raised in. But my commitment to a life of faith is still secure. And and that's what's been consistent my whole life. I love everything that you just said. You are speaking right now to a community who has largely done a lot of faith deconstruction and reconstruction. Everything you're saying is ringing true and personal to me. Would you be willing just for a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about the things in your faith work that you left behind and the things that you picked up? because that is a real common through line among a lot of my listeners. And it's so encouraging to get to learn from someone like you who is so deeply faithful that deconstructing and reconstructing, it's not a lack of faith. It is a great faith. It's a beautiful faith. It's to me the most faithful work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So in my faith communities of origin, particularly in the Christian school that I went to, The emphasis on faithfulness was connected to a subdual of the body. So 
you know, get your body under control, get your impulses under control, get your thoughts under control. There was a, it was clear that our bodies were almost our enemies. The, the, our bodies were enemies of our faith. The spirit and the body were constantly at war. And your goal was to be able to submit to the spirit by suppressing and repressing your body. And th that kind of theology, I utterly reject now. I think that we are embodied, that the Christian gospel is necessarily incarnational. It must be part of a body. And so I reject the notion that in order to be more faithful, I must be less embodied. And so I am constantly working to, to rewind and erase the tapes that play in my head from so long ago that are trying to tell me that my body is the problem. Yes. So that, that's one thing. You know, I also think that there was a... I don't know if I would call it full-on anti-intellectualism, but also critical thought was an enemy to faith as well in those communities of origin, that God's ways are not our ways, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and so you shouldn't even do any thinking. Rely on God whose thoughts will always be wise and who knows better for you and about you than you do. And now I am striving to be a thinking person of faith, a person who loves God with my mind, as one of my mentors, uh, Valerie Bridgman, Dr. Valerie Bridgman says all the time, you know, what does it mean to have a faith that animates my heart and stimulates my mind? keeps me thinking, challenges me intellectually, keeps me curious, keeps me learning. That's a big part of my faith evolution as well, to be able to have a faith that is reasonable according to my own mind, right? Not just sensual, something that I can feel, but also something that I can rationally understand. That was a big part of my faith work too, was when I was unable to reconcile what I had been taught just in my spirit versus what I could not reconcile with my mind. Because my mind was receiving information that just, it was irreconcilable. And I thought, well, which is, it? can I not trust my own eyes and ears? And so adding intellectual component back to faith has been so vibrant for me too. And what you discover is it doesn't reduce it, it expands it. It expands Absolutely. it. But there's just a beautiful world out there waiting for our brilliant brains to engage it. And our bodies, you know, of course, I, as you were, was taught that, you know, my heart was deceitful among all else, sick as the devil, who could trust it? And so I just did not trust a single thing about myself. So I was a grown adult. It's a great destruction, to be honest. And so thank you for walking through that. I, that was not a part of what I was going to ask you, but I... I'm encouraged by your story. I want to talk a little bit where this year is just, I don't even know. 2020 has really been a, it's been a real crucible for a lot of people. So personally, I wonder what has your year been like? What were you doing in March? How has your year changed? And this is something that you said that I, it actually makes me feel choked up. You said, if my faith, cannot offer me something in the wilderness moments, it isn't worth having. Can you talk about your personal year and what your faith has offered you in this just season of just loss and fear and just kind of compounded suffering? Yeah. In the spring, I mean, it almost was like I blocked out certain, I can't even remember pre-COVID. It, it almost feels like there wasn't anything before this because this has so changed what the future will be. I was teaching. I teach as an adjunct professor of theology in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova University, a Catholic school here in Philadelphia, Metro Philly. And I was in the middle of teaching three courses, two, it's really, I was really teaching two courses, but two sections of the same course 
called Do Black Lives Matter to God? So this is a course that's fundamentally trying to get at how should we make sense of the persistence of suffering and evil, particularly in the lives of Black folk in the United States? If God is good and God is just and God is powerful. And I was teaching that course in a local state correctional facility. So I had 20 guys looking back at me serving significantly long sentences. And here we are asking, do Black Lives Matter to God? And all of these guys were Black and Brown guys. I had one white guy who has an analysis. I mean, he, he had done his own work around race. And so we could have a robust conversation in that classroom. And we had just heard about COVID. We were kind of trying to see. The last conversation we had, we were talking about Uh, the uses of prison labor to make hand sanitizer in New York, in the state of New York. We were talking about the availability of hand sanitizer right there at at that facility. And so I I will say this, I guess this is going to be on the record now. I snuck in some hand sanitizer to give them, I mean, it was kind of this last, you know, the receiving line at the end of worship. They all came up to me. We didn't know whether we would meet next week. We didn't know And I squirted some hand sanitizer in their hands, you know, as a kind of way to say, I'm with you because you don't have it in here, but you need to be protected as well. That's what I remember. And that very week, Philadelphia went into quarantine and we were unable to to return to the prison. And so that's where I left off in March. To have that snatched away was particularly saddening to me. I kept in touch with them as best we could via postal mail. A couple of them had their their family members email me to give me updates. They still completed work. We sent them an an abridged version, revised version of the syllabus via postal mail. And I also sent each of them a letter, a specific letter to them. Once it was clear that we wouldn't be able to go back. And so they did complete the semester. But I'm glad I had those first seven, eight weeks with them. And I hope to get back inside once it's safe to do so. So that's where I was in terms of my teaching and professional kind of education life. In terms of my role in city government, we quickly realized that we were approaching major religious holidays and holy times for people of faith here in Philadelphia. And so I was able to craft the messaging to religious communities to help them understand how to be safe, how to celebrate and acknowledge these major holy days with COVID in mind. We did press conferences. We did, you know, we, we did all of these PSAs. We did all the, So I was grateful to be able to be in the position I was in to offer some guidance coming from a person of faith, not from a public health representative, not from a, an elected official, But I could say, I understand the heartbreak of not being able to gather with your people, feeling like you can't go to worship. So I was able to bring some empathy, bring words of of prayer and reflection in an inclusive kind of way. So it felt like an honor to be able to do that right at the beginning of the pandemic in March. It's interesting from a faith standpoint, observing suffering on such a global scale you know, this isn't just circumstantial or situational for a handful of people. This is a, a communal experience. And so I don't know if this was true for you, but I know when I grew up, so many truths of the faith, if you will, were, were very reduced, a little bit trite, especially about fear. Fear was not a concept that I felt like I was really spiritually formed around. That was seen as suspect, uh, lack of faith, you know, do not fear, perfect love casts out fear all that's in the Bible, but I felt like some of that was weaponized against real life. And so I don't think that's how it works. I don't think that's how it works at all. I I wonder if you can talk a bit about how 2020 has maybe inadvertently helped us remove some of the stigma around holding fear and faith in both hands without it compromising our faithfulness 
Yeah, because the pandemic has touched every single person, every single household has had to make some adjustment. If you haven't experienced the magnitude of loss that some have have experienced, you at least have had to adjust your routine, your staying home more, et cetera. So I think that the God has not given us a spirit of fear kind of rhetoric could not be as effective to silence us, we who are afraid, because this was touching everybody. That's right. You know, and so the pervasive nature of the pandemic was a deterrent, I think, from the kind of limited, narrow definitions of fear that are allowed to flourish when you can just make somebody feel like they're the only one afraid, right? That's right. You know, and because everybody has been afraid, we have all been like terrified. I mean, I've been terrified. Yeah, me too. So I think that that, that worked against the, the usual rhetorics of fear. I also think that you had more and more people of faith, more and more leaders of faith coming forward to say, listen, you need Jesus and you need to follow these CDC, <laughs> CDC <laughs> guidelines. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah. If you got to pray and wash your hands. And then, you know, the reason I teach a class on death and suffering is because I feel like you cannot argue with the fact of the matter that people were dying in disproportionate rates. People were getting sick in disproportionate rates. And so God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. And yet my loved one just died. I watched them die. I couldn't even be with them. I watched them over a screen, you know? And so I think more and more people were emboldened by just the truth of their own experiences. You know, you're not going to tell me that this, this is God's will. This is God's plan. You're not going to tell me to ignore the, the advice of, of these professionals I've seen it now with my own eyes. My own heart is broken. So again, our lives are sacred texts and people, people understood that in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. We are talking a little bit in this series about small wins of 2020, looking for hope, looking for grace, looking for mercy. But man, there's just been so much loss for most of us. I am sitting here with you this morning and I... I lost my marriage 26 years. The amount of suffering that you just, you just mentioned it is, it's deep and pervasive. And so I wonder if you might share a word on how to learn to live with loss, how to bring that to our faith instead of imagine that our faith abandoned us and betrayed us and how even, gosh, it's just so frustrating because I know it's true but how some of our suffering, it's eventually turned into beauty. It just is. It's turned into something lovely and strong and hopeful. And can you talk to those of us who have really suffered? I mean, just absolutely suffered this year, which is most of us. Last night I was teaching, I'm still teaching this Do Black Lives Matter to God class. We have a, a new semester now and I've got new students and we're doing it all virtually. And last night in class, we were exploring this text in Jeremiah where you have the potter at the wheel molding and shaping the clay. And we were reflecting about the fact that the potter might have something in mind. You know, you sit down at the wheel and you're going to make a bowl or you're going to make some other kind of dish. And then the clay the clay doesn't cooperate with the plan. The best intention of the potter must adapt to the motion of the wheel. And the good news is that the potter, if the potter's a good potter, a wise potter, a loving potter, won't discard the clay at the moment the potter realizes that the clay can no longer be the thing that you had first imagined. The potter simply says, okay, okay, let's see 
what else we have the potential to make from this clay. This clay, not new clay, not perfect clay, this clay still has potential to become something wonderful. And so the potter just continues the potter is dynamic enough to adapt and shift and still mold something of the clay. And I feel like that is how God relates to us, that God is the loving potter who says, oh, well, this is not what we expected. This is not even what we desired. This doesn't look good, but it can be good. Let me see. Let me see. We can mold something wonderful out of this. We will have a testimony out of this. And thinking about a life full of high highs and low lows in that way helps me to not wallow in the despair. There's so much despair. I just, I want to believe that God is still at the wheel, still saying, this thing still has some potential. Let's figure it out. I'm not going to chuck the whole project. That nothing is disposable to God. All of it is useful. As I look back on some of the most painful things in my life, you know, on the one hand, I say, whatever lesson I'm going to learn after this, it wasn't worth that. <laughs> on the one hand, I'm saying, like, you know, give me my season of, give me that back. Give me what I lost back. God has room for that too, for us to say, okay, God, I see that you're going to make something out of this, but you know, did we have to go this route? Wasn't there another way? That is right in line with the tradition, right? With the Christian tradition, we see Jesus in the garden saying, isn't there another way? Isn't there another way? So holding together the lament that there wasn't another way, that's not the way life unfolded together with the fact that the potter is always at the wheel, reshaping and remolding whatever reality is present for us. Those two things together help me make sense of suffering, make sense of loss. The death that is rampant in this season, and I don't just mean COVID death, I mean deaths of all kinds, don't need to be sanctified. You know, we don't need to say, this is the will of God. We can say that nothing is disposable to God, that God still sees us as full of potential to become. We are always becoming, and God is just nurturing like a gardener does, like a potter does, nurturing, coaxing out of us what we will become. And so that, that theological framework, certainly not the one I inherited, but the one I have adopted, has helped me make sense of this death-dealing world. I mean, all kinds of deaths. Thank you for that. I had a white snot all over my shirt. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. It's true. That is the way it works. That is how it bears out more like that redemption. And we do have a God who's weirdly flexible with humans, which is good because we're unpredictable. We don't cooperate that often, to be honest. Thank you for that sermon. That was a sermon. This season, give the gift of comfortable, washable, and sustainable shoes and bags from Rothy's. You know that I am obsessed with Rothy's. I wear my leopard print Rothy's on repeat every single week because they are so cute and so comfortable. I'm always checking out the Rothy's website to see the new colors and patterns they have because they're constantly making something new and adorable. Plus, Rothy's are made, as you know, from plastic water bottles, and they've used over 70 million water bottles to make beautiful shoes and bags and face masks, and I don't know what kind of sorcery they're using, but if you told me that these comfy shoes were made for plastic water bottles, I'd never believe you. They are magic. So if you want to score a home run gift, you need to give the gift of Rothy's. And pro tip, with a Rothy's gift card, you can let your loved ones pick their perfect present. Just saying. So check out all the amazing shoes and bags and masks available right now at rothys.com slash for the love. So that's Rothy's, R-O-T-H-Y-S, rothys.com slash for the love. Style and sustainability meet 
to create, I promise, your new favorites. Head to rothys.com slash for the love today. Guys, if you don't know about Thistle Farms, get ready to meet your new favorite doing good brand. If you've been around the podcast for a minute, you already know that I love Thistle Farms. They're a social justice enterprise that provides healing, housing, and employment for women survivors of trafficking and prostitution and addiction. They're doing the greatest work. And the way they employ survivors and fund their mission is to sell these delicious lotions and scrubs and candles and essential oils that are handmade by the women in the program. Everything Thistle Farms makes is amazing. It really is. But their candles have always been my favorite. They're handcrafted small batch soy candles made with 100% pure essential oils. Right now, I'm loving this candle in the calm scent. It's literally burning right this second in front of me. It's like standing inside of a spa. It smells absolutely incredible. And if you're looking for beautiful self-care gifts that everyone will love. Plus a gift that gives back in such a meaningful way. You've got to check out Thistle Farms. They've got an offer just for my listeners. You can use the code for the love and get 15% off their entire shop at thistlefarms.org. Stock up y'all. Go to thistlefarms.org and get 15% off using code for the love. All right, back to our show. I think one way among so many that you lead so powerfully is through the way that you connect aid communities with citywide organizations that serve people in Philadelphia. I'm thinking about the people who listen to this podcast, my community. I'm telling you, they're definitely women of action. I know that they and I would too, would love to hear some of your insights here about what you've learned and essentially community service, community development, this sort of communal work together. How do we apply some of what you've come to understand to our communities that we live in? I wonder if you might share some, a handful maybe, of the most successful ways that the faith communities you worked with this year even were able to meet the needs of people around Philly. Well, the first thing that came to my mind, we've had a lot of sessions, conversations about grief to the earlier point you were making that it's time for religious communities to actually meet people where they are and not try to move them along to some better destination. To say we can be spaces where you can bring your sackcloth and ashes, you can bring your rage, You can bring your sense of resentment, like, God, this is not what we talked about. Bring that, bring that. And so we've had lots of spaces of grief. We had one session on grief that we had 200 and something people virtually attend. It wasn't enough. People were like, is the 90 minutes over? I need more. And so we had a part two to talk about the ways grief shows up, you know, the way the trauma you were already living with and the grief you are now experiencing cooperate to make you feel how you feel and to make you do what you're doing. So I have been really delighted to see how faith leaders of all traditions and and stripes bring to the conversation rituals, theological frameworks that help people to grieve more healthily grieve more fully, feel more deeply. So those spaces, we're doing another one next Friday about healing for healers, those who are caregiving in our city. How do you care for yourself if your job is to care for others, right? So I have been really proud of the grief work that we have been doing. My mentor and colleague and friend, Reverend Lanise Pinkert, has been talking this in this season about wake work, So in in Black church traditions, there's a wake before the funeral where you come and you can can sit and rock with the grieving family members and you can pray over them and you can weep and you can, I mean, it's the time before we get to the funeral where we celebrate that this person is free from the bondages of of this life, right? 
And I think that a job of a faith community is to host the wakes for people's lives where you just sit and you feel deeply before you, you know, get off your knees and, and, and figure out what the next faithful step is. Let's just sit for a minute. And so we've been doing that work. We've also been doing these prayer pauses. So just in the middle of the day, in the middle of a week, come and connect with a faith leader who will offer you a word of nourishment and encouragement for this time. And people have done some beautiful things. I mean, we've had singing, we had, we've had ritual, we've had, you know, prayers and all of the languages, and we've heard about sacred texts from all of these traditions, and we've meditated here on, on Facebook. We're, we're going to meditate right now, center yourself. And so I'm proud of the way that the faith communities here have amplified what their traditions have to teach them about pausing, reflecting 10 toes down in your kind of spiritual disciplines. And then we'll go back to whatever it is we're doing, but it's, it's important to stop and pause first. So I'm, I'm proud of that work. I also think that one of the things that we've been able to do is have conversations about religious hospitality, especially now that people may not be able to go physically to their houses of worship. People are figuring out ways to be faithful from, from wherever you know, they happen to be, whether it's at home or, you know, amongst their colleagues at the workplace. And so what does religious hospitality mean in a multi-religious workplace, in a multi-religious society? What does it mean to make space for people to pray? What does it mean to refrain from imposing your own religious frameworks on others while being authentically religious in the way that you're religious. So we've done some work around that as well. We've talked about how quarantine might not be safe for everyone. There might be some children, some adults who are experiencing harm at home. So this is complicated for people. Everybody's not safe at home, even though we're telling people you're safer at home. So bringing faith leaders to the table and really not only telling them how they can support and how they can show up in charitable ways, but also how can you refrain from exacerbating the pain that's out here, right? What are some of the pithy sayings that we have that when we reflect on them a little more, they actually cause more harm, right? So it's, it's both come here to learn about ways in which you can be helpful and not harmful, but also come here to serve. Hear about how you can serve people right now even though you can't get into your building, there are other people, other ways that you can you can be helpful. So those are those are some of the things that we've been trying to do over the last six or seven months during this time. And we hope to continue to do that work. Beautiful practices, both in and out of COVID. We're gonna take a lot of the lessons that we learned having been forced into them, I think into this next season of, of community recovery and once we're able to gather and put our hands on each other again, which will come, this will not last forever. It will come. That's right. But I think some of these practices that we learned in this moment of, of suffering and isolation are going to serve us well. I really do. And I really loved everything that you just said. I'm thinking through how am I practicing those right now in my life? And so I'm curious about this, Reverend Naomi, because as you just mentioned, like, you listed it. You are doing a lot of heavy lifting right now to nurture other people, to nurture their faith, to nurture their hope and their own sense of wellness. And so I'd love to hear what you are doing to show a lot of compassion, mercy, and grace to yourself. What does that look like for you? Because you, I mean, you just mentioned, how do we care for the caregivers? You're a caregiver. What are you doing to stay well? Yes. One thing that I am doing is moving, exercising. I was feeling terrible, just always cranky, always tired. I don't think I was pleasant to be around, frankly, for my family. My wife started first. She was exercising daily in the basement. That just makes me mad. (laughs) I want you first. I don't want somebody in my vicinity to do it at me. Don't exercise 
at me. And it sucks that, you know, we made the basement my like office and, and it's also the, the space where she does her workouts. And so I would have to like get my stuff and move, leave. And so after so much of that, like, <laughs> I was like, well, let me stop leaving the room. So we, we have been going for walks every morning. First it was like a mile and then it was two miles and then we would take different routes. And now it's at the point where I'm like, come on, let's go. We have to do our walk. We have to do our walk. We have started to do a yoga class. It's run by a, a wonderful woman who does yoga for bigger bodies. And she's very clear and very unapologetic in her desire to make hospitable space, radical space, radically loving space for people of all body types to come and do yoga. And so we, we do that weekly. We just started a weekly Zumba class that's <laughs> kicking my butt. So yeah, nice. that has been incredible for me. I just feel like I'm better to be around. I feel better in my body. That has been wonderful. And I'm so excited to not only continue to feel the results of that in my body, but continue to develop this intimacy, right, with my wife, because we're doing this stuff together. That has been wonderful. We also adopted a dog in July. real. And so I think that my animal mom is very different from like the Naomi that I'm used to. <laughs> so to be tender and to be, you know, the, the animals, they talk back to you, but only if you're listening very specifically, right? They're not using words. So it just requires a different tuning of your ear, a different tuning a different clarity in your vision, right? To really see what's going on with them. And so that nurtures something else in me. And the grace of having these animals who are so loyal and committed to you, you know, and you're having a bad day, but they don't maybe don't know it. And so they still, they still show up. And it's kind of like, you know, this animal is still showing up. Let me get over myself and still continue to show up in the ways I need to show up, right? And so they're, they're really transforming me. We have a cat and a dog now. And so they're just changing me. And they, they are a form of self-care for me. Yes, absolutely. All of us who love animals are nodding our heads. Like, yes, this is real. <laughs> this is not yeah, physical. yeah. It is nurturing these pets who love us no matter what. They're happy it's COVID. We're home all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, they make me more tender and more gentle and more patient. And so that's been great. I think the other thing is I have really been trying to nurture friendships during this time. I mean, I'm a person who, and I don't know who this resonates with. I don't have a lot of friends. It's been that, that way since I was a kid. And I, I see other people, my wife's one of them, who have these wonderful, long-lasting friendships. And I just look with awe like, wow. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of go back to my 12-year-old self and sort of ask people, like, do you want to be my friend? Can we, can we be friends? Kind of awkward. <laughs> and I'm like, so that means for me, like, I'll check in with you a couple times a week, see what's going on, and you check in with me. And it's really, you know, I'm pushing 40, and I have no idea what to, how do you even – make a friend. But I'm taking this time of, you know, I'm not traveling, I'm not on somebody's plane or somebody's train and we're doing this or that. I have more time to sort of cultivate these friendships. And that has been nourishing to me as a person who feels like, you know, maybe I've cultivated a, a lone ranger kind of life because of that. We don't stay alive alone, you know? We are saved by community. We are saved by our friendships. And so I really want to, I really want to know what that is. And so I'm trying to put in some work to make that possible for me. Mm, I love that. My friendships have saved my life this year with no hyperbole at all. It's just the mm. truth. Even if you can't be with all of your people this holiday season, you can still bring them together with the gift of family history and ancestry. Right now, the holiday sale at Ancestry is the perfect time to treat someone you love to a gift that connects them to family in obviously new and meaningful ways. 
find amazing prices on gifts like an ancestry gift membership that'll let your loved one discover the fascinating people in their past, or you can surprise them with ancestry DNA so they can uncover their origins. You already know how much I love ancestry. I've used it to figure out where my ancestors were from. And there's something special about knowing the people who came before me are almost entirely from the UK and thinking about the history they lived through there. I feel it makes me feel more rooted in who I am. So don't miss special holiday pricing on truly meaningful gifts during the holiday sale at Ancestry. Head to my URL at ancestry.com slash for the love to get your Ancestry health kit today. Okay, it's ancestry.com slash for the love. Listen to me. Taking care of your mind and mental health is just as important as taking care of your body and soul. And BetterHelp is here to make caring for your mental health easy and affordable. So with BetterHelp, you can connect with a licensed professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can start communicating with your counselor between 24 to 48 hours via text, chat, phone, video. And if it's not a great fit, you can even change counselors at no cost. And listen, you're definitely not alone in this. So many people have been using BetterHelp. They're actually recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As one of my listeners, you'll get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. Okay, back to our show. One more question and then we'll start wrapping it up. I wonder, what do you hope that faith communities and people of the spirit take away from this pandemic? You've said that you hope that we don't go back to normal. Can you talk more about that and maybe what your vision of hope might be for what comes next for us? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go back to where we were. I'm not in any hurry because the pandemic has shown us where we were. We were wholly unprepared to take care of our most vulnerable folks. We were not listening to the signs that we were unprepared for a time like this. I think we're resting on our laurels, especially those of us who are in more progressive spaces, like we're doing the work around racial justice. And so We've come a long way. No, I think this this summer particularly has shown us, no, we've got a long way to go. And so I don't want to go back to the sense of complacency that I think we had. I want to always be vigilant. COVID has taught us to always be vigilant. You're always like, is my mask on right? Where am I standing in relationship to someone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I, let me make sure there are enough resources for you. Let me make sure. We need to keep that same energy. <laughs> after this. Let me mind my proximity to you, right? Let me think before I presume that I have access to you. I mean, and I say this as a, as a Black woman living in this body, knowing that often Black bodies are seen as wholly accessible while at the same time being illegible, right? And so this, this whole six feet thing, let's, let's learn something about that right, about keeping distance, about being invited closer. Let's learn something about how what you do protects someone else. So wearing the mask is less about me and more about you. Let's take that same lesson and know that each one of our decisions has a ripple effect and may impact someone outside of my circle in more severe and detrimental ways than it even impacts me, right? That's what COVID is teaching us. I hope that we keep the same energy around Black Lives Matter. We shouldn't need a video. We shouldn't need a video. We have to have some reckoning around our commitment to solving our problems with weapons, solving our conflicts with violence. We had to have a reckoning. And so that's what I mean. What does it mean to be a spiritual community without a building? And all of the preoccupations that come with a building. You're right. Okay, so we got to go back into the building. Okay. But can we keep the same focus on 
be in community regardless of where we are. That's what I mean when I say I hope that we don't go back to normal. And I hope we keep some of these same sensitivities that we've now had to develop because of COVID. I hope we keep them uh, post-COVID. Mm, yes, and amen. Okay, Reverend Naomi, we're going to wrap it up here. These are, off the top of your head, questions that were asking everybody in this particular series. Here's the first one. Because, you know, we're kind of leaning into the possibility of small wins, of gratitude wherever we can find it. What's something that you were grateful for this year? Octavia Butler. I have reread the parable of the sower, um, which is one of my faves by Octavia Butler. It keeps reverberating over and over again. So I'm, I'm grateful for the time to be able to sit down and read that book again. Perfect. Oh, well, we'll link to that, everybody, so you can see that and get that, too. How about this one? What's one maybe small way that 2020 has changed you for the better? I have slowed down. Yeah, me too. I have slowed down and I can notice more now. I don't miss as much. Yeah, right? I was missing so much. Right in my house, I was missing. I was missing so much. And now I notice things. I can agree more. Here's the last question. I ask every single guest in every single series this question, and I heard it from Barbara Brown Taylor, who's an Episcopal priest. Uh, and, and you can answer it however you want. I mean, when I tell you we've gotten every kind of answer to this question, I mean it. But here's what she puts to us. What is saving your life right now? So really, going to bed at a reasonable time. <laughs> um, I know what you're saying. What does that mean for you? What time is a reasonable time to you? You know, if I get to bed before midnight, that's a reasonable time. That's what I thought. Same. It was out of control before. Out of control. It's saving my life. It's saving my marriage. It's saving, it's probably saving my work because I'm just better able to do it. I didn't know. I mean, I heard you here all your life. You need to get, but yeah, they, that's for real, y'all. That's for real. <laughs> <laughs> that's a discipline. You know, you and I, I bet we're wired similar because there's always more to do. I have never one time, not one day in my life, got to the end of the day and said, all my work is done ever, it never always done. And so I could just keep going. I have the capacity to do it. You do too. But getting a normal amount of hours of sleep a night, it's a game changer. This is what people want to tell us. Right. <laughs> what was I doing? I know. I know. Um, I want to say to you, Thank you for being who you are in the world and for this work that you put your hand to. It, it's meaningful. It's, it matters. You are, your life is beautiful and your leadership is profound. I want to thank you for making me ball my eyes out this morning all over my shirt. You ministered to me today. So thank you for that. I am grateful and I needed to hear what you had to say. And I'm just, I'm proud of you. Like I'm proud to be your sister. I'm proud of another woman of faith out there leading in such integrity and such beauty and honor. It's saving my life right now. I'll tell you that. And so can you just tell my community where they can find you, how they can follow you and where and all of that good stuff? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Jen, so much. This has been such an honor and a gift. I am on Twitter and my Twitter name, my Twitter handle is at all holy shift, which for all the reasons you think. Yes. Oh, just, just, oh, holy shift. Same thing on Instagram. Oh, holy shift. And you can find me under my name on Facebook, Naomi Washington Lee Park. Perfect. And we'll have that for you guys, listeners. So we'll have a one-stop shop for you. So you can follow Reverend Naomi everywhere she's at. Thank you. Thank you for being on today. Thank you for being who you are. Your time was a real gift. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you all who are listening Give yourself some grace. Give yourself some grace. On that note, thank you. I hope that was even half as meaningful to you as it was to me. I hope that you felt nurtured and seen and cared for in that, that your fear 
and your losses and your suffering and your hope, they all get to live beautifully inside this faith network that was given to us. We, it really, no matter what we've been told, no matter how we grew up learning that fear or doubt or suffering were somehow indicators that we were doing it wrong, that we were getting faith wrong, it's not true. It's a part of being a human and faith doesn't condemn our pain. Rather, it nurtures it and it settles right alongside of it and holds it with tender hands. So you're going to want to follow Reverend Naomi everywhere, obviously. If you go to the jenhatmaker.com website underneath the podcast tab, we'll have absolutely everything here. Everything that Reverend Naomi talked about, all of her handles, kind of a one-stop shop for her work and where you can find her out in the world. And, and I hope it served you well today. It sure did me. Thank you so much for being a part of this special series and just being a part of this podcast community. We are, we just love you. We love you and we're grateful for you. And our real joy is thinking this podcast through, like, how can we serve our community? What conversations do we want to have? How do we want to learn together? How do we want to move forward together? What do we want to develop in one another? And here we are. So Laura and the whole podcast team and Amanda and I love you and we're grateful for you and it's our pleasure to serve you. Okay, guys, until next week, see you then.